Welcome back to 10 Things in the Light novel that the anime missed for Ascendance of a Bookworm, Part 2, Volume 1. In the previous video, we covered the first three items that the anime adaptation missed. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you to check it out. I think it may be one of my favorite videos I've made so far just because it includes two of my all-time favorite characters in the series. Now, Part 2, Volume 1 is chock full of content, so it's no surprise that six episodes were not enough to cover it entirely. So if you've never read the light novel but are a fan of the anime, this video is for you. Remember to check out the other videos in the series. All the links are on the description below. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's continue where we left off. Meet Hugo and Ella. We get to meet them briefly in the anime when they start working at Mine's kitchen at the temple, and they make some soup and pizza for Mine and Benno under Fran's direction. Unfortunately, we don't get the whole chapter that involves their training. Now, a little of what I'm going to share with you here is actually from the next volume, but as there will be too much to cover for part 2 volume 2, I'm just going to put it here. Now, Hugo is a young professional cook at one of the city's restaurants, and Benno hires him for the Italian restaurant that he's planning on opening. Benno is looking for an apprentice cook that would work under him as his assistant. Unfortunately, because the training is to take place at the temple, there are no takers. The temple has a terrible reputation. Commoners fear because it is a place where they could come into contact with nobles, and where it is said that women could be abused. Now, one day when she was at a meeting at the Eatery Guild, Ella overheard Benno's conversation about looking for an assistant for a restaurant he's going to open. She perks up at the opportunity and inquires about the job. You see, she just wants to get out of her uncle's restaurant. In this world, female cooks also work as waitresses. And if they happen to catch the eye of a client and that client wants to sleep with them, then they have no choice but to do so. Ella's own uncle has his daughter do those kinds of things, so there's absolutely no reason why he wouldn't put Ella to work in that same way. Ella wants to escape that fate. Her only alternative was to become such a good noble's chef that she could start out a business on her own. In fact, her goal is to become like Liza, the guildmaster's cook, who had distinguished herself and was now one of the top cooks in the city. So even though she's still a cook's apprentice, and even though she'd be working at the temple, she goes for the job that no one really wants, and is relieved when Benno tells her that she'd be working for a shrine maiden, and she wouldn't have to work as a waitress at the temple. And so she ends up working side by side with Hugo. As fellow co-workers, they experience the same culture shock of what it means to work for mine. Unlike the dirty kitchens from the lower city, the one in the temple is large, has a huge oven, and is cleaned to a shine. They are expected to keep it that way too, and are forced to adopt strict cleanliness standards like, you know, bathing every day, washing their hands often, and wearing clean clothes every day, you know, just basics. The culture shock doesn't stop there though. They are taken aback by the recipes, especially the soup. We learn from the light novels that in this world, they believe that not throwing away the water after boiling vegetables lets all sorts of tiny bits of dirt and filth get into the water and the food. And most importantly, they believe that using cooking water will make you miscarry or become unable to have kids. They are super grossed out at the new way of cooking the soup, but they do as they are instructed, because their employer is quietly watching them work. Fran and Benno told Mine that, as a blue robe, she cannot interact directly with the cooks. So while she and Benno can watch the proceedings in the kitchen from a distance, Fran is actually the one that is training them, reading aloud to them the instructions that Mine had previously written. Benno tells Mine that looking on as they work will also be training for Hugo and Ella to learn to work while under the scrutiny of nobles. Mine is in awe at how adroit her new cooks are. She notes that they work quickly and efficiently, and their knife work is super impressive. She forgets herself for a moment and compliments them, but that just makes them freeze up in fear. Benno motions for her to shut up and let them do their work. The hour of truth finally comes, the soup is done, and the cooks must try and see how it tastes. Hugo and Ella are beyond shocked at how good it is. It is so good that Hugo tries it again and again, and Ella has to remind him not to eat at all and to save her some. 
At the end of the first day of training, despite the challenges of working for a noble and despite having to whip up strange and elaborate recipes, they are super eager to learn as many new recipes as possible and are super pumped up to make mine more meals. The beauty of the light novels is that, yes, mine is responsible for introducing all these amazing things and awesome recipes to the people of this new world. But she doesn't do it all by herself. Mine is too small and weak to do most things. Mine just can't. So she must rely on others. There's craftsmen and craftswomen and many skilled workers who are instrumental in bringing her ideas to life. Unfortunately, the anime skips delving into these characters in favor of moving the story forward, which I totally understand. It's a different medium. But it is an absolute joy to get to know characters like Hugo and Ella in the light novel and also get to learn more about their backgrounds and motivations. And speaking of talented individuals, we really need to talk about Johan or rather, Johan, as is pronounced in German. Now, I am going to try my best to pronounce Johan properly in this video, but if I don't get it right every time, please excuse me and cut a girl some slack. I am not a native English speaker, and I worked really hard to get my Y sounds and J sounds straight. There's a stupid story that's totally irrelevant, but when I was in high school, one of my teachers asked me, where was my dream college? Where did I want to go if I could? And I was like, I want to go to jail. And the whole class laughed because I meant to say Yale, but they all thought I wanted to join the penitentiary system. So it feels kind of weird for me to go back to mispronouncing my J sounds in this case and saying Johan instead of Johan. Poor, poor Johan. They totally glossed over his introduction, even though he plays a central role in Mind's master plan to take over the world, I mean, to make more books. So let's start from the top. Upon seeing Fran struggle to jot down notes on a board while out and about, Mind decides to make an easy to carry notepad, more specifically, something called a diptych that would let him make notes without needing ink. She also plans to make one for Lutz. Now, Gunther was able to help her with her project, making the wooden part of the diptych, but unfortunately, she had to find someone else to help with the metal parts, that is, with the hoops that would join the two boards together and the stylus that would be used like a pen to scratch out the letters in the wax. Thankfully, Benno has plenty of wealth and connections to get her what she needs and introduces her to the foreman of a smithy. She describes to the man what she needs and makes sketches of the rings and the stylus, but as the items seem to be small and need detailed work, he calls over one of his apprentices. Johan is a young man with bright orange hair who appears to be around 20 years old. He came over and immediately began drawing out blueprints and asking questions about the items she wanted, such as how small she wanted the tip of the stylus to be, its exact thickness, and so on. He even brought over metal cylinders of different weights and thicknesses to get her to pick which size was more comfortable for her to write with. Lutz also chose one that would fit him best, and heck, even Benno orders one for himself. He has absolutely no idea what she's on about, but decides he wants one too. <laughs> anyway, Johan asked more questions. Way more questions. He is so precise and demanded so many details that it caught her off guard. But she reasoned that that level of detail would guarantee a satisfactory result and happily answered each question. Unfortunately, very few people share that sentiment. The foreman tells them that Johan's work is always top quality because he is obsessed with details. He will never settle for subpar work. And that's part of his problem too. It comes at the cost of speed. He even mentions that Johan could have been a master by now, except that there's few customers who bother to work with someone as fastidious as him. The foreman asks Benno if he knows of someone who could become Johan's patron and who could make good use of his talents. And though he immediately strikes down the idea of a little twerp like mine having enough capital to become Johan's patron, the idea is still out there and mine is not at all against taking him on for future work. We will, of course, see more of Johan's work in the following volumes. Um, 
And while on the subject of the diptych, it was during this time that we got to see just how much Lutz has grown as an apprentice merchant. Remember, it hasn't been much more than a few months since his baptism, but Lutz has been working really hard. And he's also a very special case. Early on in the book, we're told that Mark has taken Lutz's education on hand. In fact, if you remember from the last volume, where we have Mark's short story, please watch this video if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Mark vowed to raise Lutz in such a way that he would survive being dragged around by mine. <laughs> now, Mark has made good on that resolve. Even though it's only his first year as an apprentice, Lutz's training already includes plenty of personal experience in the field. Mark and Benno are eager to have him take part in the construction of new businesses with an aim to have him help with the opening of the Italian restaurant and in opening more paper-making workshops in other cities. Mine has a glimpse of how far he's come when they go visit a woodworking workshop and she makes a fairly large order there for the boards that she'll use to make the karuta. To their surprise, Sieg, one of Lutz's older brothers, works there and it is him who Mine puts in the job request to. She names a sum per karuta card, but he declines to get involved in the money talks, leaving it to his supervisor. The supervisor tries to take advantage of mine, but Lutz steps in and begins negotiating on her behalf to keep the price down. She notes that Lutz has learned a lot from Mark, imitating him even in his expressions and the way he smiles as he talks business. Lutz's brother, however, is deeply disturbed at seeing Lutz in action. Sieg yells and tries to interfere with the negotiations, but Mine tells him that Lutz is just doing his job as an apprentice merchant, just as he himself is learning to be a craftsman. Meanwhile, Benno is silently watching the whole exchange play out. Mine describes him as fondly regarding Lutz's personal growth. And when the supervisor finally agrees on the price that Mine had originally suggested, Benno proudly ruffles Lutz's hair as they leave. And oh my gosh, my little heart cannot take this adorableness. Last video, I mentioned how mine and Benno's relationship had evolved over time and how great that was. But can we please just stop and take a moment to appreciate Lutz and Benno's relationship as well? Daddy Benno is the absolute best. I just love how he's taken on Lutz. Lutz, who you will all remember just a year ago, had been the illiterate runt of the litter, yet who persevered and is doing his utmost to catch up and learn as much as he can. Benno is a smart man. He knows that Lutz is the link that they will need to keep mine tied to their company. But he also has seen that Lutz is a hard worker, bright, driven, and valuable in his own right. And because of this, he's already planning on having him be his successor and adopt him if necessary. Whether Benno sees himself in Lutz, or whether he sees him as a kid he never had, it is still super adorable. Now, before going into the last item that I'll cover in this video, I would like to remind you that if you've enjoyed this video so far, please hit the like button and subscribe. And if you haven't already followed me on Twitter, please do so. Now, let's talk about one of the central conflicts in the book that is closely tied to Lutz's magnificent growth, and that is Lutz's relationship with his family. You all know that I love the anime, but I honestly didn't understand what the heck was going on in this episode. Died just came across as an abusive lout. Carla got on my nerves for backpedaling on her decision to support Lutz in his choice of career. And in the end, Lutz was forced to apologize to everyone and humble himself for absolutely no reason. It was most unfair. It wasn't until I read the light novel that I actually understood what the heck was everyone's problem. So let's start from the top. Carla and Died agreed to let Lutz pursue his dream, even though they believe that he will fail. After all, they know next to nothing about what he's been doing and how much he's progressed in the past year, either because they actively choose to not know or because Lutz has been secretive about it. Probably he just doesn't want him to hassle him. Whatever the case, they still let him do what he wants, but expect him to take responsibility for his decision by not complaining when it gets tough or crying about it when his plans fail in the end. The troubling thing for them, however, is that Lutz is being asked to do something that is far beyond the scope of a mere junior apprentice. Remember, there are two kinds of employees in this world. The first are the lowly lehangas, that is the 7 to 10 year old kiddos who do mostly grunt work in the store while undergoing training in much the same way that a part-timing intern would in our world. The second type are the full-time letterls, 
management-level employees with long-term contracts that guarantee benefits, better pay, and such other perks. To Lutz's parents, it is unreasonable that Lutz, a mere lehange, should be asked to go out of the city and venture beyond its protective walls. They worry for his safety and see absolutely no reason why Lutz's apprentice training should include Lutz's putting himself in potential harm's way. Lutz, however, did not understand this. He thought it was just his parents not wanting him to be a merchant at all, rather than a valid concern for his safety and a not unreasonable point regarding what should and shouldn't be expected of him. No matter how much Lutz insists on getting his way, they have no reason to trust his employer. They don't know anything about this Benno guy, and they probably don't know his plans about him making Lutz his successor, and even if they did know about these plans, what kind of merchant would make a kiddo like their son their successor after less than a season has passed? Died is not the only one with a communication problem. The entire family, and yes, this includes Lutz too, has a communication problem, and the situation is ultimately made worse when Mine gets involved and suggests that Lutz enter the temple's orphanage. His father sees this as Lutz being a baby, for he believes that his son is just running away to have others solve his problem for him rather than dealing with it himself. As everyone talks things out during the meeting, Mine sees the error of her ways, so that when Lutz is made to apologize to everyone, she also joins in and apologizes as well. So you have both kiddos apologizing, though no one can hear Mine's voice because she's holding on to that magic tool. Lutz's parents look at Lutz, but Mark, Benno, and Ferdinand are looking in Mine's direction as they apologize, clearly blaming her for blowing up the incident. Yet, if she hadn't forced a family meeting like this one, nothing would have been resolved and Lutz and his family might never have come to work things out in a manner that would satisfy everybody. There were some little bits that I wish that they would have left in the anime. One of them was the fact that while Ferdinand had Mine hold on to the eavesdropping tool, he wasn't even touching the magic tool during the meeting and just let it hang from his wrist on a chain. And Mine realizes that from the very beginning, he had not intended to hear a word she said during the conversation. So this exchange between Ferdinand and Mine in the anime never happened in the light novel. And so Benno and Dai talk out like civilized people and in the end, Dai agrees to the letter contract and letting Lutz go out of the city. He admits that no matter how much he wants to help Lutz, he doesn't know anything about merchant work, so if Benno wants to trust the whole business to his son, then the letter contract will be good for Lutz. So off they go to the merchant's guild to sign the contract. The epilogue of this volume is actually Dyde's point of view as they all make the journey to the merchant's guild to sign the letter contract. Dyde feels incredibly out of place in the merchant's guild, especially when they go up to the upper floors that are more opulently furnished. But he notices that Lutz is able to navigate that strange new world with ease. Not only does his son have a magic card that lets him in through the gates, but he clearly fits in with the merchants. He speaks like them, dresses like them, has formed connections among them. And, as Lutz reads out loud the literal contract and explains the meaning behind certain phrases that merchants use, Died notices that not only is his son literate and smart, he grudgingly admits to himself that his son wasn't being a baby after all. Look at you being a man, he thinks proudly as he looks at his son. The chapter ends with Died encouraging his son, loudly telling him to give it all he's got, while Lutz promises to become the best merchant, one who would make them proud. So, while on the whole, Died is loud and brash and very rough around the edges, I can see his and Carla's point. Furthermore, the light novel clearly conveys that Lutz's parents truly care for their son in their own rough and imperfect way. Oh, and this scene in the anime? I totally hate it. In fact, I have erased it from my mind and you should too. It wasn't even on the light novels for crying out loud. Okay, time to stop. We will finish this volume, I promise you, in the next video, where we cover the last three items in the list. There are some really fun and cute short stories that we have to get through, and a bit of world building stuff that is really interesting and helps flesh out the world that Kazuki Sensei envisioned when writing this novel. I hope you join me for that video. Until then, see you around in the Bookworm Discord, and follow me on Twitter to get regular updates on my progress, bookworm memes, and Ferdinand pictures as I work my way through the Ferdinand A to Zs, which is as fun and glorious as it sounds, really. Check out all the other videos in the series that I've made so far, and pick up the light novels if you get the chance. All the links are in the description. Thank you for watching and for your support. You're all the best. Love you. Bye-bye.